Hold on to your butts. We are changing the course of history as we see it. That is what Wesker demands. Now this affects Iris. Um, Iris, where are you? What you feel only matters to you. I do not entertain hypotheticals. The world as it is is vexing enough. Iris, I have a tip for you. Don't take drugs! Or whatever movies with Wesley and Iris. What up? And welcome to Or Whatever Movies. I'm your co-host, Iris, and I'm here with my older brother. Wesley. That was pretty bad. Yeah. <laughs> was that more Christian Bale? I don't know. It's just the bat voice. The bat voice is like gravelly, kind of husky. Arguably, it could be Tim Burton's Michael well, Keaton. Yeah, I think it goes all the way back to Michael Keaton. Yeah, it could be Michael Keaton's Batman 1989. I mean, the concept is Bruce Wayne needs to conceal his identity and therefore he changes his voice. Yep. And so he does this gravelly, whispery, emo thing. In what movie? In all of them. I know. What movie are we talking about? <laughs> Today we're talking a movie from 2022, streaming on HBO Max, The Batman. When I heard they were going super dark and gothic and going back to his more practical detective roots, I was pretty excited. So this is in the Batman DNA for him to be vigilante detective? Yes. Well, I mean, his original DNA. I, it's hard to suggest that every all the subsequent stuff didn't become canon. There's obviously a difference between the comics and the movies, but boy, those movies, get, if you were alive in the 90s, those movies got pretty silly. Yeah, let's recap those. But first, doesn't he look a little silly wearing the Bat costume <sighs> when he's like looking at evidence and going through a crime scene? Maybe when he is vengeance and he is the knight, he looks scary and like the crow perched atop, you know, high atop Gotham, staring down and, and striking fear in the hearts of criminals and stuff. Cape all flying behind him right? and stuff. But practically speaking, when he's like checking out spoons <laughs> and opening birthday <laughs> cards and stuff, yes, he looks kind of dumb. And it brings me to the point that I'm hesitant to bring up because it dispels this whole illusion of coolness is that Batman, unfortunately, has never fully not looked dumb. <laughs> Even in his all black, black shadow, you know, we're, we've come a long way from the Adam West cartoony padded suit costume thing. You still think he looks dumb? I have to think that the campiness was somewhat intentional because it was like the pow and the zoinks and all that stuff that was meant to be cartoony. There's memes and stuff about how much darker Batman got and by like 2025, it's just blackness. <laughs> and, and so this was very dark. I mean, we saw it at, at a premium theater where they actually turned the lights up on the projector. But if you go to one of the cheaper theaters where they turned down the brightness and the bulb, this movie probably would have been unbearable. But when he mm. is cloaked in shadow and looks super cool and you get profiles, outlines, that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. when he emerges mm -hmm. from that subway terminal to beat up those faux Joker gangster guys and he, he comes mm -hmm. out of there like the bear Jew and in Inglorious Bastards, you know, and then he's scary. <laughs> Uh, so I, the emo boots. I, so I think it's necessary. But yeah, if you get a good look at his stitched together leather mask and his little nose guard all stitched on, he looks kind of silly. And I attribute it to the cowl, the little mouth sticking out from the bottom and the, the Captain America style cowl. Who else wears a cowl? Batman and the Flash and Captain America in the Marvel. They, they all look stupid. These are square jawed, good looking dudes and, and everything and all muscle bound and I, I came to the realization with the Batman that it just never looks cool. What exactly is the cowl? The headpiece that only covers part of the head. It's not a full face mask. I don't know. It's hard. The costumes in this one look more real as like something yeah, that could very practical. be practical, right? That can be cobbled together, and it's not that Batman has a like a a latex team or like a molding plastic molding team, but when it gets practical, it looks. Dumb, like you get the underpants on the face Catwoman look and the, the trash bag man Riddler look. <laughs> Not to be confused with a trash man or a garbage removal person, noble pursuit, but he looks like he's made of trash bags. <laughs> it seems like trash bags, maybe some duct tape. Yep. I liked the glasses on top. That was an interesting touch. Yeah, it was based on the Zodiac Killer. 
the sketches that were made of the Zodiac Killer, which has disturbing connotations, except that in basing this character on the Zodiac Killer, the unknown Zodiac Killer's persona, they never say it. So he's just a nerd in glasses. I would argue that Trash Bag Man Riddler looks cooler, though, than bespectacled Paul Dano. <laughs> <laughs> Were you surprised to see Paul Dano or did you know? I knew. He's the Riddler, but I didn't know if he was going to be unmasked or that he was going to spend so much time as like Nerdy Ed in the jail cell. He was only scary in the same way that the dude from The Bodyguard was scary. <laughs> Bruce no. Wayne. No. No. That guy? Yeah, that guy. I didn't know it was Paul Dano. I was surprised to see Peter Sarsgaard, John Turturro. I was shocked to see Colin Farrell. I was just seeing these people as they were revealed. And uh, really interesting cast. Yeah, I got to hand it to Colin Farrell, who, while he looked dumb, kind of a stereotype, but he completely disappeared. I mean, I showed Kelly the photos before and after for the makeup, and we couldn't see him, really. I mean, I guess kind of his eyes because he went to like Starbucks and stuff and people didn't recognize him. But yeah, I mean, it, it kind of could have been a random dude playing that. Yeah. Colin Fowler brought his signature freneticism and energy to the part, but he was unrecognizable. He was a pretty stereotypical Italian gangster archetype. So I thought Gordon was Commissioner Gordon. Why was he Lieutenant Gordon? Because this is like Batman year two. It's not quite an origin story. I guess as it goes, the Joker had already been dealt with. And the Joker cameo, which to everyone's mind, seemed to suggest, as previous films had done, that Joker was next up in the Batman lineup. According to the sources I read, the Joker had already been dealt with and was in Arkham and maybe they would plot and escape or whatever. But he is young Batman, but not year one. He's already been through some stuff. He's still kind of awkward at it and figuring it out. He's like 30 years old. And Jim Gordon isn't quite at commissioner level yet. Okay. Well, that makes a ton of sense. And Alfred was looking a little younger than usual, at least younger than the Alfred in 1989 Batman. Yeah. I mean, maybe they're looking for sustainability and to keep him, keep the Alfred character around for a while. Jeremy Irons was kind of a young, fit Alfred as well. And uh, Michael Caine, not so much. Uh, Michael Goh, not so much from the 1989 Batman. Oh, yeah, that was Michael Caine. Okay, so we talked about the Alfreds. Let's talk about the Batmans. Ben Affleck was going to write, produce, direct, star in the Batman and that would have been very cool because Ben Affleck is a very good director. And then he got all embittered and embattled with alcohol and embittered by the Justice League and got disillusioned and stepped back and was like, I need a person to come in to take this who's actually going to be enthusiastic and work really hard. Enter Matt Reeves. Enter Matt Reeves, longtime Batman fan, established director, been around for a long time, and had a take that he seemed to sell Warner Brothers on. And I think on paper, it was a very good take. I was very keen on this earlier look, not him as a little kid or anything like that, but this earlier look at him as a fledgling of sorts, crime fighter, who is more the detective. Batman is supposed to be the world's greatest detective. That was completely lost on me. I was like, what's he doing at all the crime scenes? Right. And... Where they like walk into this tree trunk and you look up and it's Batman standing there. <laughs> exactly. So that was kind of new to me, I guess, probably because previous directors and previous incarnations didn't want to just be standing around in the silly bat suit. Matt Reeves, when he when Ben Affleck dropped out, took it in a completely different direction. But isn't the Batman rather like Christopher Nolan's Batman? It's dark and gritty. It's realistic. It somehow feels even more Christopher Nolan-y because it's Robert Pattinson. <laughs> but that Batman was, it was practical and it was dark and gritty, but it was also more sleek. As cumbersome as I think that Batmobile was, and as fantastic as some of those elements, they were still rooted in practicality, which makes it feel big and, and important. But I guess the only distinction here is that this is a decidedly more noir feel. Which complements the whole detective thing well. Don't get me wrong. I enjoyed the Batman. A little long. But the, all the detective-y stuff didn't help with the pacing. Did you feel like it actually helped the story for him to spend so much time at the crime scenes? No, actually. I've wanted, ultimately wanted Batman to be cool and sleek and fast and scary. And he was those things when the time came. 
But yeah, him brainstorming the riddles and clomping around with his wet boots on the hardwood floors of Gotham City's fashionable residences. It, it did slow it down. It felt like if Batman had an insider or something on the police force or among the detectives who was feeding him the information, because he was obviously tech savvy and as much as he could be and was keeping up on stuff. But uh, if he was just the enforcer, that might have been, that might have picked up, helped the pacing a bit. Christopher Nolan's Batman, Bruce Wayne had a love interest, but Batman didn't, right? Mm, well, not a consistent love interest. Bruce Wayne is interested in chicks because he was set up to be the playboy. And Rachel Dawes in the first couple of movies was his love interest. But the identity was definitely separate. So Batman didn't have a love interest, whereas in The Batman... He's digging Catwoman. That's part of the disguise, though, right? The allure of Batman is his dark, unknowable sexiness, I guess. He knew her, He knew everything about her. He called her Selina. Yeah, this was her figuring stuff out, too. She was, I don't know that she was the Catwoman. She was probably just starting to figure out what that persona or whatever was. And now she's going away to figure out herself some more? Yeah, to Blood Haven. Their little... Last ride on the motorcycles <laughs> was just so indicative of this movie. It's like this prolonged, protracted goodbye. They could have kissed and ridden away and that that was it. Yep. But just like kind of everything else pacing wise in this movie, you know, it takes him a beat to answer a question with one word and it takes him a beat to <laughs> make an action. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. Like everything is contemplated and paced for some kind of dramatic effect. Yes, I do. I also felt like the ending was tacked on because we got dirty savior of Batman guiding with the torch, the Lady Liberty torch through the flooded Gotham. And he was very dirty. And the next scene, he was all cleaned up to say goodbye and smooch and ride off on their motorcycles. But I <laughs> so you are you aware that Batman and Bruce Wayne were modeled on Kurt Cobain? Batman and Bruce Wayne were modeled on Kurt Cobain. Yep. Well, they did have that Nirvana song. Yep. Front and center. Repeatedly, yeah. But it was the emo vibe, and, and he was supposed to be reclusive. And when it comes down to it, Kurt Cobain could throw down. And he was definitely a howler and a screecher, but he was also reclusive and emo in his sweaters. And uh, the Last Days movie, the I think it was Gus Van Sant, he did the fictionalized Kurt Cobain movie where he's like hanging out and smoking in a crumbling manner. And stuff, and that's very much who this Batman was when he wasn't throwing down and being vengeance. But Kurt Cobain, in interviews and stuff, wasn't super dynamic. He kind of came along live on stage, and they were like, "What do you think?" And he's like, "Well, I don't know." You know, that's it, that's not a Kurt Cobain impression because that's terrible. But if you're emo, then you think about stuff for too long, and you're kind of boring and downcast in interviews. And he was brooding and quiet. And only turned on the bear Jew when he had to. Contrasted by Paul Dano's frenetic, crazy-eyed The Riddler? I guess so. He he was also kind of nerdy. Not He wasn't Jim Carrey. I mean, it's hard because we're basing this universe, these quiet, soft villains, on the hyper-color, cartoony Joel Schumacher versions. Paul Dano succeeding Jim Carrey's last time we saw The Riddler, you know? Yeah, I mean, just a world of a difference. But I think I get, I'm picking up what you're putting down. I think the Batman was <laughs> definitely cool in parts, would have benefited from a solid 45 minutes of trim. It was cool while it was cool and boring when it wasn't. Well, that pretty much sums it up. But I also, I can't get away from A, they looked kind of dumb. Because Batman, I think, should be a little bit more sleek and hyper-stylized and just kind of comes out of the night to attack and land on people and kill him and scare the bejesus out of him. Do you think it's because you had so much time to look at him? Honestly, so here's what I can't get away from. It looked kind of gross, kind of distasteful, except for the ultra cool moments. I was very excited and we saw the Batman in theaters and then it dropped on HBO not long after. Available now on HBO Max, by the way. And I couldn't bring myself to sit down and watch it again. I rewatched parts of it and I started with good intentions, but I just couldn't get through the Batman again on HBO Max. Well, it's quite a commitment at <laughs> three hours. But how many times did we watch the three hours long Titanic? 
And of course, that was a vast cast and a completely different animal. But it turns out that the Batman was around three hours long. And my understanding was it was only incrementally longer than the Christopher Nolan ones. In fact, there was this weird thing where it was 11 minutes longer than The Dark Knight Rises, which was 11 minutes longer than The Dark Knight, which was 11 minutes longer than Batman Begins. So we're cranking it up a little bit, but not crazy. It's not like, what, these were all 90 minutes and the Batman is three hours long? No way. You know, it's not like that. Mm. It just felt long and plotting. And it didn't feel like it had to be long. I mean, really, you could have just cut out air and... <laughs> cut, cut out the emo. <laughs> yeah, just, exactly. The emo air, the emo fluff. I want to say that the Batman was fun when it was fun. and It was kind of boring when it was boring. It was progressive in a way as it addressed some political climate of the times. You know, their portrayal of Bella Real. I'm assuming that's not canon. And that was something that was entirely new. And though I liked, you know, the progress that her character stood for, I felt like we kind of also backstepped. I felt like it was also a step back or so with the Zoe Kravitz Catwoman incarnation, which was hyper, hyper sexualized. I mean, more so than Michelle Pfeiffer. No, but that you're talking Michelle Pfeiffer from 92, you know, the 90s. Yep. Early at that. I don't know. I mean, you're also catering to the Batman fetishists, right? I don't know. I guess you have to, I guess as a director, you have to consider that niche audience. But really, you're going for the mass appeal. I don't know. I, I was just very sensitive to and a little. If you, if you want to talk about being grossed out, I was a little like kind of grossed out at how hypersexualized she was. She, I think she was like a call girl for the penguin or she was at least like his sexy assistant. Honestly, this is where I fell off. I tried to treat Batman as a watcher. I tried to pay close attention to the politics of it. And I wanted to know how Falcone was was integrated in the, the political community of Gotham and the Peter Sarsgaard character. And then I simply stopped caring. And the the congressman or the guy who who was killed at the beginning, the mayor guy. Yeah, the mayor uh, incumbent. And they talked about a lot of people and they had the mayoral election and stuff. And I was like, okay, let's get back to Batman. And then the car growled and I was like, ooh. And the car was like on <laughs> fire under the hood. And I was like, whoa. And it was meant to be scary. And that car chase was awesome. And then we like did some political stuff. And I was like, okay. Yeah, well, <laughs> the political stuff, I think, was intended to make the characters not quite so good and bad. Like the Riddler is actually uncovering a real conspiracy. He's doing a social service by uncovering this mass political conspiracy and all of these dirty politicians and dirty, the dirty DA and the dirty cops and all that yada yada. You know, you're so we're suggesting that the Riddler's actually doing something good. He's just going about it in a very twisted way. And ultimately, that's what the Riddler hoped would unite him in the Batman. Right. And they drew those parallels all throughout the movie. And the Batman can be argued as the same thing. He was, I guess he was on the right side of the law in this particular movie because he hung out with the cops all the time until he punched Gordon in the mouth. At Gordon's request. Right. But still, like the Dark Knight and the Dark Knight Rises, he toes that line and, and crosses over when he has to to get his, his man, like uh, Rooster Cogburn and True Grit. Is he a good guy? Sure. Is he likable? I guess so. I'm ba I'm guessing that was the first time that Rooster Cogburn and the Batman were ever compared. You're talking Jeff Bridges as the next Batman? Uh, a little bit older, but he would have made a good Al <laughs> Alfred. <laughs> Sit down, eat something. Made you a chicken sandwich. <laughs> they they did all kinds of different directions, and I'm not sure there was ever an Alfred like Andy Serkis, who of course followed Matt Reeves from the Planet of the Apes films. And we're we're talking Andy Circus like Gollum Andy Circus, right? Yeah. King Kong Andy Circus even. Supreme Leader Snoke Andy Circus. I mean, wouldn't you say that for a super emo Batman, Robert Pattinson's the dude? Is he like the right dude? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, he's the right dude. Talk about emo navel gazy. I mean, I didn't see the Twilight stuff. And he's not even really known for that stuff anymore. He's separated himself from that image perhaps no did you see good time mm -mm. the safety's good time so that was what matt reeves based this batman on and he wrote it with robert pattinson in mind not knowing whether or not he would be interested in the role because yeah to your point he eschewed the uh bigger studio fare and the grander stuff because he doesn't like attention very much and that worked nicely 
for the emo Batman. Like I would imagine if you ran up on Robert Pattinson and was like, oh my God, the Batman, he would act a lot like the Bruce Wayne character in this movie (laughs) and be hugely uncomfortable and silent. But you're in for it now. Robert Pattinson as the Batman, the second installment, has been officially announced of a proposed trilogy of its own. Yeah, it's CinemaCon. It's official. Yep, there are even spinoffs. Isn't there going to be like a Penguin show or something? (laughs) I think so. Are you excited? Uh, I mean, whatever. I think Robert Pattinson is a good Batman. People love the Ben Affleck Batman. I mean, not aside from the movies, just him. And I liked him as being slightly older and heavily muscled and hulking and scary looking. Um, everyone looks dumb in the suit. There's no getting around it. But I think as Batman go, I think Christian Bale was good. I think Robert Pattinson is a very good choice. There's some weirdness about the mouth. Like, you have to have a distinctive mouth as Batman, and Michael Keaton has a weird mouth. Val Kilmer definitely has a weird mouth. George Clooney, I think, has the square jaw and stuff. But Robert Pattinson is maybe the most normal Batman mouth, because Christian Bale definitely has a weird mouth. It would be like Brad Pitt being all mouthy, and you you know it's Brad Pitt under the cowl. <laughs> If Brad Pitt would be was was under the cowl, it'd be so obvious. Right? He'd be like chewing be like, gum Brad, and stuff. Why are you wearing that? <laughs> right. And I think Catwoman works best when she doesn't have the underpants on her head or whatever that mask was. It was like a gym headband or something. Remember at the start of the pandemic when people were making masks out of everything that they could find? Oh. Yeah. And they were literally t- making underwear masks. Yeah, and there's a dude in Walmart that had an array of pool noodles. In all directions Ooh. around his head so that he is like a distancer. So like, hey, don't don't come within the base of my pool noodles attached to his head like an umbrella. He was like, oh, these pool noodles are six feet long. <laughs> right. This is perfect. Uh, this is a not I mean, if, if there was ever a Batman movie that was full of communicable diseases, it was the Batman. The Batman was seedy and gross and scummy. I didn't know that you could make Gotham look more scummy. That whole this whole movie was dirty. Yeah, and wet, very rainy, and, and unsanitary. Gotham. Very seven. It was like seven. It was yep. like seven's version of L.A. Very much like that. Except the Batman was done with LED screens, and seven was done practically on location. This thing was like almost entirely shot, like on a stage with LED panels. Like back screens. Back screens, front screens, top screens, like 360 degrees of programmable LED LED panels depicting Gotham. What? Yeah, dude. All right, whatever. It felt real to me. At least maybe it's because we've been conditioned to see Batman a different way. And this felt, I appreciated it, but I also appreciated the masks all around. I appreciated that the rain obscured some of the flaws. The darkness in tone obscured the flaws. uh, And then the blinding action and and ruthlessness and savagery of the Batman when he got his hackles up was all good. You know, when he's just like screaming and getting shot and and, and obscured in the darkness and the only illumination in the thing is machine gun fire. And he took many hits to the chest and nobody shot him in the face. It all sufficed to make it feel real to me. So I'm surprised to hear that. I don't know why they never shoot him in the face. Seriously. A practical Batman. He didn't have like a Marvel kind of shield because this is DC, like a magical Wakandan shield or something. He put a lot of faith in that body armor because he took many, many gunshots. And uh... well, it seemed like he didn't have a ton of value for his life. He was consumed by his vengeance. And it wasn't until the end that he really understood his purpose and therefore maybe valued his life a little bit more. Like, it seemed like he was just walking into certain death with no regard because he was on a mission. Yeah, that's kind of Batman to me, is ruthless and damaged. Um, he was described as broken and driven in his noirness. And I will add young to that and kind of foolish. Did you say yum? Young. Oh, yum. <laughs> I was like, yeah, he's pretty yummy. Ew. And speaking of yummy, and I know you're going to cut this out, but Peter Sarsgaard. What the hell, dude? I don't understand. And not bearded, which was nice, but also really emo, like oddly emo for this film. Like his D.A. Gil Coulson was like all lovesick and sad and emo. And like when she rejects him and she's like, taxi. And he's like, "Okay, well, bye. Yeah. The car chase was cool. 
1969 Dodge Charger with the top chopped off and a jet engine, and it was cool. I didn't need the tank Batmobile. Best Batmobile since 1989. No shields, no protective shields, but pretty cool. But also, the car chase itself, was that really necessary? Yes. And a car chase with pe- the Penguin? Yes. It was like in an Audi? Whatever. He was in a Maserati. But yes, it was <laughs> the, the Batmobiles need car chases. There was a cursory one in... Batman versus Superman or whatever. And that's kind of it. And then it's more showcasing the Batmobile in the in the Joel Schumacher ones. And then it was the Batmobile being an efficient night vehicle in the Dark Knight stuff. And in this one, it was cool and skin. That's what it's meant to be. It's meant to scare the bejesus out of people. It's meant to be intimidating. And it was. It did have shields because the penguin opened fire with the Uzi right against his window and the bat didn't even flinch but appropriately scary and a good car chase. What was cool about the Batman? That car chase. But what you're saying is the Bat chase is compulsory and it felt that way. No, it was scripted and choreographed and meant to be. I mean, he hit the stupid ramp and then he came through the flames and it was dumb and everything, but it was also cool. Batman is a hellfire, unstoppable vigilante and he's coming for you in his growly car. When the penguin gets rammed, when he gets rear-ended by the Batmobile... (laughs) <laughs> completely not practical yeah the whole thing was not practical but it was cool okay whatever <laughs> i don't want to rain on whatever happy parade you have for really? the, batman. the batman rained all over itself it was non-stop <laughs> and rainy and dreary and emo except when it wasn't when it was cool we were kind of emo in our discussion about the batman and now I feel like we so we were just like following suit. What's your rating? Following of the Batman suit. From Get it? Batman oh. was all right. <laughs> Batman was all right. It was there were great, really cool YouTubeable things about it. I don't know that I'll ever sit down again for a three hour runtime to reveal the intricacies. There is a lot there. This is a little bit like the Joker, which I also didn't fanboy over. It was fine. It just was very involved. And if you want to pick apart the meaning or even track the mysteries, the after credit scene is deliberately confounding. And you can do all this Blair Witch style digging through the websites to uncover reveal the Riddler's true intentions, and I stopped caring because the car chase was over. A lot, a lot, a lot of detail for the Batman. Can't be faulted for that in a three-hour runtime that just wasn't my jam fine. It's all right. What about you? It's well done, and for that reason, I give it a good. It's, um... It's the Dune of DC movies. <laughs> it was, it's very Dune-like. I think there's something to that. There's some emo zeitgeist of the 2020s that we're capturing recapturing from the 90s oh that's my era yeah and i think it's all just it's coming back and folding in on itself but certainly can't fault the batman for its quality or its execution a really well-made film a fantastic cast all the way from robert pattinson through zoe kravitz to colin farrell to paul dano who was kind of channeling his um they will be blood character yeah that's what paul dano's got He's, he's just a soft, sort of emo, squishy guy who, when he wraps up in a trash bag, is scared. But he is undoubtedly smart, and that makes him terrifying. <laughs> Though I'm not going to fanboy, I'm not going to fangirl it out. I'm definitely looking forward to their reunion in whatever the next Batman is called. So that's our review on The Batman from 2022, available now on HBO Max and still in theaters at the time of this recording. I hope you enjoyed our discussion. If you did, would you consider subscribing to our podcast? Maybe giving us a five-star rating, following us on Instagram. Supporting us on Patreon. Supporting us on Patreon. Or leaving us a voicemail at 818-835-0473. Or maybe even sending us an email at orwhatevermovies at gmail.com. Check out our companion discussion to The Batman, which is on... Batman from 1989, starring Michael Keaton, available at orwhatevermovies.com. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.